Well, I have the unenviable, oh, my microphone is sliding in. The unenviable position of preaching immediately following the lunch break. So I hope everyone um, is awake, well-fed, well-rested, and I hope that I don't lull you back into that nap that you were probably taking before this. Um, would you join me in a reading of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 24 through 27? Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And this is the word of the Lord. You know, ancient people knew a lot about foundations. Odds are, if you were the average Jew living in Palestine in the first century, you lived in a house that your father and grandfather had built. And when it came time for you to be married and to move out, you would build a house nearby or possibly even attached to the house of your parents. But we don't live in first century Palestine. We don't know a lot about foundations because we pay people to build our foundations. When, I, when we buy houses, they've been, they've been laid by professionals, and if we had to build a foundation, we wouldn't even know where to start. So this afternoon, as we reflect upon this passage, I want to engage us in an imaginative exercise to help us understand the power and the reality of this final parable of the Sermon on the Mount. So this afternoon, I want you to put on your togas and journey with me back in time to ancient Rome, um, to the late first century. I want you to imagine for the sake of this exercise that you come from a fairly wealthy family living in southern Italy. Your father has been a Roman military officer and he's been away fighting the empire's wars in foreign lands filled with strange people. And he does pretty well for himself in that he actually manages to come back from the war alive. And as a reward, Caesar gives him some more land and a title and a, a house in Rome. And your father moves your family to the imperial city. And you are excited because Rome is Rome is Rome. It's everything that the empire represents, its power, its opulence, its wealth, its grandeur. And as you approach the city from the south on the way from your home to this new place, you confront there a building that literally dwarfs your ability to comprehend the rest of the city. The walls of this building rise nearly 165 feet into the air. It's shaped like an oval, and the circumference is over 20 thousand feet long, and half as many gods and heroes stare down at you from niches along the wall. The walls are made out of sturdy Roman brick, and they're faced in glittering Italian marble. 50,000 Roman citizens stream into this building through 65 entrances. On the air, you can smell the acrid bitterness of blood, and the shouts from this building are deafening because you're looking at the newly dedicated Flavian Amphitheater. The building that history will eventually come to call the Colosseum, a building that still stands in the center of Rome today. But then something happens. Your father does something that deeply offends the emperor. Now don't worry, we're talking about Domitian and this is a very easy thing to do, but it has real consequences. I'm glad you guys laughed at that. That really makes, as a classics major, that makes my heart happy. But these things do have real consequences, and so the emperor sends your family away. He sends you to the strangest and most remote part of the empire. He sends your family to Judea. Worse, he sends you to the Galilee, this strange provincial backwater that even the Jews of Jerusalem ridicule and avoid, and you don't know what to do with yourself. You're in a strange land far from everything that you've ever known. But then one day you go to Sepphoris the largest city in the region and one of its administrative centers. And in that city, you see there a building that looks familiar. You see a civil basilica, a kind of courthouse slash shopping mall slash public forum slash everything, really. And it's so Roman that it looks as though some giant has plucked this building from the imperial forum in Rome and placed it in this strange Judean hillside. Even in Sepphoris, you can find yourself a piece of home, something that reminds you of where you came from. It's complete with fluted columns and shining marble and fine statuary and the most sumptuous mosaic carpets that you've ever seen. And despite the fact that no one around you wears a toga or speaks a word of Greek or even worships the same gods that you do, you resign yourself to the fact that here in Sepphoris, there's a little bit of home that you can cling to. But time wears on, as time tends to do, and the centuries begin to pass. 
And in the late fourth century, an earthquake rumbles through the Galilee and destroys that basilica that you enjoyed so much. Later on in the fifth century, another earthquake rumbles through Italy, but the Colosseum survives. There's another one in the mid-14th century, and there are fires, and the, the Colosseum is mined by the city's medieval architects to build the rest of medieval Rome. The Frangipani family takes over and turns it into a fortress, and in later centuries, it becomes a church, it becomes housing, it becomes workshops, it even uh, temporarily acts as a bullfighting ring. Today, it stands in the center of one of Rome's busiest traffic circles and is a symbol of Rome's permanence a symbol of, of the eternal city, as it's called. Now, why is that? Why is it that any of us could go to Rome and climb the Colosseum? We could explore its substructures and walk around in all three of its tiers and see the place where gladiators fought, where animals fought, where prisoners were executed. But if we wanted to go to Sepphoris, we wouldn't have the first idea what we were looking at because it's a ruin. It's completely gone. You need the complex knowledge of a trained archaeologist to begin interpreting what exists at Sepphoris. Why? Thankfully, the answer to this question, I can tell you in one word, and that word is foundations. You see, two summers ago, I had the pleasure to excavate at Sepphoris. I was excavating in the basilica that I've been talking about, and I learned there that when the Romans built the city of Sepphoris, they were in a hurry. And when they built this building in particular, they cheated. See, instead of digging all the way down to bedrock and founding this, this city and the building firmly on solid ground, they dug hurried trenches and they, ch they chunked in these rough-hewn pieces of local chalk. They packed it in and they built the walls on top of that and the building certainly looked beautiful. It had every appearance of a strong Roman building, but when that earthquake came in the fourth century, the walls buckled and collapsed in on itself. And there's nothing left. I see, too many times I'm afraid that you and I are like the Roman builders at Sepphoris. We want to raise something beautiful and magnificent, something that reminds us of the home that we came from, something that the world will marvel at that we cheat. We replace the very best methods with things that are just good enough. And see, there's nothing inherently wrong with chalk. If you want to go right on a blackboard or if you want a, a stone that is smooth and easy to shape, it's, it's great, it's perfect, but it is not foundational material. See, too many times I worry that you and I take good things, things like social justice, things like preaching, things like the academy, things like the church, things like our religions, and we make those our foundations. We pour our efforts into building on those things, things which are still good and desirable and totally appropriate, but they are not foundational materials. We miss the solid ground that is right beside us. Let me offer you an example. See, this past summer, I was blessed to be at a preaching camp that was jointly sponsored by the Academy and by the Fund for Theological Education. And we began our preaching in a conference room much like this one, except we didn't have a nice, sturdy podium. We had a, I don't really know what to, it was more of a glorified music stand, it was what it was. <laughs> And as, as each of us approached the podium, we put our weight on it, and it began to shake. And we all made some kind of comment about it. It came up in a few sermons, I think, and I was, I was frustrated. But despite the fact that we didn't need to cling to that podium, we did. Yeah. Every single one of us was, was like this, like clinging for dear life to this podium as it moved around the floor. Despite the fact that we didn't need it, we clung to it for dear, dear life. Now, this parable has always fascinated me because it's how Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount. It's his final move. It's his last conclusion. And he talks about two kinds of people. He talks about wise people and foolish people. And the wise people are those who have built their houses on the rock, and the foolish are those who have built their houses on the sand. I've been here for a few days now, and I know that there are many wise people in this room I applaud your efforts, all that you have done and are doing and will do for the kingdom. But for just a minute this afternoon, I want to talk to those of us who may identify more with the foolish people than with the wise people. See, I want to talk to you because I don't believe for a second that any of you chose to be foolish. 
You know, my friend Wes, who introduced me, once preached a sermon on the young ruler in Luke chapter 18, and he had a line in there that stuck with me, although I think he may have borrowed it from Fred Craddock, and it was this, that the young ruler didn't wake up one morning and say to himself, you know what, today I'm going to choose to love mammon more than God. In the same way, I don't think any of us ever woke up and looked at the houses of our soul and said, today I'm going to go over to that sandy spot and that's where I'm going to start building. None of us woke up and said, I'm going to deliberately do what I know to be wrong. It is a subtle, slow, subversive, seductive, and painful process. And when that crash comes, it comes suddenly. And all we can do is watch while the pieces of our lives crumble in around us. The worst part is this fact that none of us ever thought about it. None of us ever planned on being foolish. In fact, if we asked ourselves who we thought we were, we thought we were the wise man. We worked hard. We thought we were using good materials. We poured our lives, our livelihoods into this building. But somewhere along the way, something happened. Someone tricked us, or maybe we tricked ourselves. Maybe somebody told us a lie about the building technique, and we began to doubt our dreams, our visions, and we built smaller than we should have, or maybe we built larger than we should have. Or maybe along the way, somebody gave us some shoddy material, and we were trusting. We had no reason to doubt that lumber salesman who sold us that wood that was riddled by termites, but when we used it to build, it collapsed. Maybe the building inspector came along and told us that our houses looked kind of funny. It didn't fit his code. It didn't fit his vision. It didn't fit his dreams. And so we scrapped our original plans, our good plans, and we built something different, something that wasn't really ours. Whatever happened, it happened slowly. It happened quietly. But the crash didn't come quietly. When the winds of violence came shrieking through our lives, our houses began to shudder. When the rains of recession began to fall, the roof began to sag. When the ground started shaking underneath our feet, our walls began to crack and buckle. And when that final crack of lightning came, when that loved one died or that plan fell through or that theological assumption that we thought was so fundamental to our existence was shown to be less than true, it all snapped. It all fell through. And if you haven't experienced that pain I can't even begin to explain it to you. It is the deepest ache that I have ever known. As a result, some of you might feel alienated. Some of you might feel abandoned, cheated, abused, alone. You and I in those situations sit like Job in the middle of wreckage. All we can do is scrape ourselves and listen to the advice of our friends, which isn't very good advice. And we have no desire to pick up the pieces, no desire to rebuild. For those of you who feel this way today, I have such great and wonderful news for you. See, you tell me that your house has fallen down, and I, as a good Southern gentleman, must tell you that I know someone who can help you. See, I just happen to know a carpenter. See, I just happen to know a carpenter with years of experience in building foundations. I know a carpenter who was probably there at Sepphoris, and he pointed to that building, and he told those Romans that when you build on chalk, everything's going to fall down. I know a carpenter who was himself rejected by human builders, but I also know a carpenter who became the chief cornerstone of my faith. I know a carpenter who never said that broken pieces couldn't be made into something new, something beautiful, something whole. I know a carpenter who offered himself as the broken foundation for my life. For my redemption. See, I know this carpenter who takes special, beautiful, tender joy in taking those pieces of a broken house and putting them back together again. In fact, it's his specialty. This carpenter's name is Jesus Christ, and he wants to rebuild the soul of your house today. Amen. Amen.